common, but not but not known by everyone, huh? So a little bit of my background. Um, graduated here in mines in uh, 1979 in mining engineering. Started out in coal in Wyoming. Uh, spent about seven years there, and then subsequent to that, most of my time was spent in in gold. Other than running a chemical plant for a couple of years in New Jersey, that was a the version that I took and decided I wanted to get back into mining. So came back with Newmont here in Denver, um, spent about 12 years with Newmont. Most of that time was international in Peru for three years and in Ghana, West Africa for four years. And then went with a uh, royalty company, a company that actually provides uh, capital to the industry and supports projects and uh, was responsible for all of our project evaluations around the world. And that was with Royal Gold. They are, they are based here in, in Denver. Um, and then spent time with some uh, junior companies, uh, Midway Gold and Argonaut Gold, and had a producing mine that we started up in Nevada and then uh, operations in, in Mexico. Um, I got my, an MBA from uh, Wharton um, after about 15 years of working, I went back to in an executive program and uh, spent most of my professional career on kind of the executive management side of things as opposed to being a pure mining, mining engineer. I don't know if I could ever have done that or could, I know I couldn't do it today anymore. Um, and uh, I'm currently uh, active at, at Mines here. I'm the president of the Alumni Association past press uh, chairman of the Colorado Mining Association and member of Nevada Mining Association when I worked and lived out in Nevada. Um, wanted to talk to you a little bit today about something that's probably less technical, a little bit more on the business side of things. Um, it is actually where some of your technical mine plans come together with business. Start talk about strategic planning. So um, kind of the context of the discussion is going to be to compare and contrast strategic planning with other components of planning like business planning, budgeting, forecasting, and talk a little bit about the uh, annual planning cycle. You have to look at uh, the three dots. Oh, okay. Yep, scroll down. Yep. I, Dave. There you go. Go up, go up. Hi. No. Hi. Control. Control, Alt, Shift, H. There you go. Yeah, there you go. That one? Yes, that one. Okay. It's Thanks. I needed that. So, strategic planning. Uh, strategic planning is generally about setting direction, kind of having a, a view, a vision of the future, and then trying to get a company, its resources aligned with that direction, help to guide some of the decision making um, at an executive level, at a corporate level. And then it begins the process of allocating resources, both uh, money, people, expertise. And I'm going to talk at, at more of a kind of uh, uh, focus primarily on strategic planning. Um, and I'm just going to give you my experiences, what, who's involved with it. Um, it's different at every company. It's different at big companies and small companies. It's different in service companies versus producers. It's certainly different in exploration uh, versus operations. Um, but generally speaking, I'm going to talk to the, the strategic planning that happens at the executive level. It doesn't necessarily involve the whole organization. And the perspective is very a high level view of the company. Where are we going? How are we going to get there? What's important to us? Um, what are our constraints? What are our objectives? And it includes understanding trends, both in the company, but, but more so in the industry, 
and in this case, I think in mining as far as in trends as in the world. Um, the time frame is typically uh, a life of mine perspective with an emphasis on the first three to five years. And again, each, each company is probably different. My history has been that do a life of mine plan, focus on the first three to five years. Um, and that that plan is revised in detail probably every two to three years. It's not necessarily an every year exercise. And I'll contrast that with business planning, which um, business planning is generally about developing a specific roadmap or a blueprint, defining initiatives uh, and plans that deliver the strategic plan. Uh, business planning is usually a coordinated effort across the entirety of the company in different organizations and different functions. Um, and the business plan's perspective is usually short to, to midterm. And taking a look at what the challenges are, what the capital allocation is going to be, um, and at the time frame, one year to, to three years, and typically a business plan is revised, updated uh, annually. And business planning done on an annual basis then takes you into budgeting. And budgeting is a pretty uh, significantly lower level than strategic planning. Uh, all of the uh, parts of the company are usually involved. Um, it's a detailed plan. It's something you're going to be held accountable for, something you're going to have to deliver on. It establishes accountabilities and allocates resources and generally involves the entire, the entire business unit, the entire company. It's usually involved in, in budgeting, whereas strategic planning is it's probably more an executive uh, perspective. And budgeting is typically done at the level that gets managed, whether that's expiration operations, whether it's accounting, um, technical services. <clears throat> and budget is typically done annually by months and a full plan is typically done annually. Uh, sometimes when things get real dynamic in the industry, you're doing budgets more often than annually, but that's not necessarily by design. That's more in reaction to the realities of the, of the industry. And after you have a budget established, we typically have forecasts that are done to update the budget, update it with actuals, to take a look at new challenges, <clears throat> to talk about a need for any course corrections that you might have that you want to forecast. And Though I would say most most forecasts are done on a twelve year, uh, I'm sorry, twelve month monthly basis, uh, but some of the more advanced planning organizations actually look at twenty four to thirty six month rolling forecasts, which are much more helpful, I think, in managing business, but much more challenging for the organization to deliver on. Um, and forecasts typically are done at least quarterly. If not, if not monthly, and, and that's that's pretty much a um, a result or a function of the company and the detail that you want, and how well things are going, and how well historically you perform against your annual budget. Uh, some companies have given up the idea of budgeting and just just run forecasts because they say the world changes too fast. Um, I think that's that's probably a function of the capabilities of those people doing the plans. <clears throat> so those are kind of the, the plans that are not strategic planning, the, the business plan, budgeting, forecasting. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what are the components of strategic planning. I mentioned that the purpose is to set direction, to guide decisions, to prioritize, allocate resources, and establish some of the, the bounds that you might want to evaluate from a scenario standpoint. <clears throat> Strategic planning is usually a function where you kind of define the, co the company's um, competitive advantage. Uh, what do we do better than anyone else? 
and usually includes a strength, weaknesses, opportunities, threat evaluation and discussion to take a look at where's the where's the company uh, in the industry and how is it how is it doing against its targets. Um, and the it's a key role. Strategic plan is a key role of managers and management setting setting that direction. And it's a it's a process. It's not necessarily just the product and the plan. And that's what I want to emphasize a little bit as I as I talk this evening about what's the process and the value of that process in and of itself. It's usually coordinated, it's cross-functional, even though all the individuals in the functions don't get involved. To have a complete strategic plan, you need to have input and participation by all of the, the business functions. And they, they would contribute at their level of granularity that they can see uh, going forward. Not all, and that's not gonna be the same in all cases. It being a process versus a product, uh, the numbers certainly are representative of the plan, but not necessarily the point of the of the exercise. Uh, I think there's something that's that's going to be more valuable to the company. Um, and sometimes we, as engineers, get get too hung up on the details of the numbers and the, and the, the numbers and the plan, as opposed to understanding it as a process whereby we can have a dialogue and we can have discussion about where's the company going, how are we going to get there, what are the challenges. So that's just kind of a, a caution to some of, uh, some of us that might be on the technical side of things that it's a good time to sit back and kind of think differently about uh, the world and the plan. So I talked about the process. And want to talk about some of the values of the process as opposed to the product. The first is that there's actually a dialogue and a narrative that goes on amongst the participants in the process. And, and they'll have uh, typically a series of discussions that go over a period of weeks or months. And it, actually that narrative and that dialogue amongst the company is certainly much more valuable, I believe, than the, the numbers that come out of it. It establishes some of the understanding between different functions. What are the challenges? What are the issues? Um, what has to be overcome in order to be successful? Um, it's also, this is where a lot of your um, strategic directives get embedded in the plan. Uh, things like ESG, um, sustainability, would certainly come in at the strategic planning level. Um, and are a very important part of the process because they kind of define the boundaries going forward, where we're going to work, how we're going to work, how we're going to get things done. <clears throat> it also provides for a lot of debate and discussion uh, and kind of some pushing you know, back and forth between where are the limited resources going to be allocated? Um, we're gonna, what are we going to do with exploration? What are we going to do with operations? What are we going to do with acquisitions? <laughs> Um, what are our constraints and needs from a government standpoint, from an environmental standpoint, from a reclamation standpoint? So a lot, all those issues should really get embedded into the strategic plan. They're not something that come up as an afterthought of planning. They should be primary to the, uh, to the plan. The, um, that discussion and that dialogue then gets a lot of the buy-in and understanding uh, from various parts of the organization. And I think those that are kind of watching the process have to understand uh, and, and watch for how well people are participating. Are they fully engaging in the discussions and in the dialogue? Because if not, this, I mean, this plan's going forward and, and we're, gonna, we're gonna develop budgets and forecasts and business plans around it. But if it's set in the wrong direction, we're gonna get the wrong results. So that debate, that discussion, that back and forth, setting direction, setting priorities um, are really uh, the most essential part of the process. And from my perspective, that outcome is as important, if not more important than the numbers themselves. So the numbers are going to change. The numbers are going to be representative. I mean, that plan is only 
uh, completed at one point in time. And as soon as you get done with that, you're gonna move on to, to a different scenario, to different, different challenges. And it's also a means then after the management and executives have developed that plan and a strategy going forward is how do we communicate that to the broader organization? So it's a great tool for communications, which is part of the alignment uh, of the planning process. And I should have said, or would hope you would interrupt me with questions as you have them, as we go through it. I will also have time when we're done, obviously. There's also some value in having this process pretty well defined and using the same process year over year, period over period, um, so that you get some understanding of kind of the rhythm of the business. And uh, you, you've tested, you've had these dialogues, you've had these discussions in the same kind of format. And if you use the same model and the same approach, you can actually evaluate how are we doing on this strategic plan? Where did we fall down with others? If you're changing the process all the time, it's very hard for an organization to really follow that direction. So using the same approach, the same model generally, different results, different inputs, different outputs, but you want to have a consistent methodology over time. That's going to be, that's going to help you um, advance the, the challenge, overcome the challenges and advance the company as well as you can. And a comparison to prior plans provides some very valuable insights, particularly when you have the discussion and debate of what was the cause uh, of them and how do we prevent that on a go forward basis. What are the changes that we need to do to incorporate into the plan that uh, that didn't weren't represented in the previous plan? And planning is not should not be a static process. We don't do a plan, put it on the shelf, and then the next time we look at it is you know, two or three years from now when we when we decide to do another strategic plan. It should be an ongoing process, um, and that that document that business plan should be used, I think, to, to um, communicate with the organization on an ongoing basis. It's not do the plan, put it on the shelf, and, and let it gather, gather dust till the next time. Um, that should be the driver and the part, particularly at an executive level, level of the discussions and the uh, uh, decisions that are being made. They're consistent with uh, our strategy. And if not, why not? And if it's significantly significantly different enough, should we be redoing our strategic plan? Which basically may ensure that our strategic plan and our and how we run the company are consistent because that's what's been communicated to the organization. So it's fluid and it's continuous. Not all companies necessarily use the concept of scenario planning. Um, some of them don't have that much variability. Um, some don't have enough resources to do it. But I think some of the, some of the better planning organizations um, kind of pride themselves on the planning process, which includes taking a look at various scenarios. <clears throat> But those, those organizations that are most successful and can use those plans the best, I think, are the ones that um, they're, they're doing scenario planning, not necessarily just to run different numbers, not just to throw a high number and a low number and a medium number at it, to actually talk about what are the changes in the landscape as we see them going forward? What are the changes that we see in the strengths and, and opportunities of our organization? And also, how do we monitor uh, performance of the plan? Um, so if you're running scenarios, a company that I was with called them, typically you had, an, uh, you had your base case, which is kind of a realistic estimate of what do you think the world looks like. But then we would be required to run <clears throat> an optimistic case and a pessimistic case. And that just didn't mean, in the case of gold mining, it just didn't mean a different gold price it meant where do we see the world going relative to our business, whether that's gold or copper or, or coal, where's the world going? 
Um, what are the challenges? What are the opportunities? And how can we quantify them into a scenario that looks at this optimistic view of the world and a pessimistic view of the world and have that different differential from kind of our realistic plan be significant enough that it's meaningful. The reason that a lot of companies use that kind of scenario planning is to help actually manage the company and to, to um, monitor and guide it through a changing world. <clears throat> Rather than just having one plan, and you don't know how much variability there is around that plan before things re look really poor or look really wet, really good, <clears throat> You actually have some guideposts to know um, going forward. And as you observe the performance of the company, you know whether you're leaning towards the optimistic or pessimistic side or you're right down the middle. So, so you just keep doing what you've been doing. But the value of having, uh, the value we always found of having those plans out there was it helped us to anticipate the, the needs as they changed. And we already had an idea, although we didn't spend an enormous amount of time uh, planning those scenarios, we knew what the major changes would were that would occur and what we would have to do. So that was kind of an approach to dealing with uncertainty, dealing with risk, uh, dealing with a changing world is by running some scenarios and have them be, be meaningful, take enough time to have this whole organization look at those plans. But I would say nominally that um, we probably spent 60 to 70% of our time on the realistic core plan and then 25 to 30% on the other, the other plans, but they were just as helpful to the, to the process and also helped us to identify, you know, early, early issues and early challenges. There's a lot of tools out there, Monte Carlo simulation, many others um, that can be used in these plans and these scenarios. And, and that can mean talking about scenarios at various levels within the, within the company, from a mining company. Um, you know, do you go all the way back down to redesign the pits for a optimistic and a pessimistic case? Probably not, because that's probably not warranted. This is done more at the senior executive level. Um, but if things start to change, people are gonna come back and say, what's the impact on our on our mine plants, on our pit designs, on our pit limits, uh, on our operating costs. Um, so having those scenarios out there at a, at, a, at a high level can be very helpful in, in helping to run the business. And the other thing that scenario analysis approach looks at is, um, as I mentioned, risk management. Uh, the enterprise risk management uh, of a company often is evaluated in these various scenarios. Um, whether that is just uh, unexpected events or it's black swan type events that you're actually going to put some plans around. Um, various degrees that you can run scenarios. Um, and I think some of, and, and certainly in today's world, the complexity and the speed of changes that we're seeing in, in the world, not just in the mining industry, um, certainly warrant some discussion and thought about scenario planning. And I also think that you as future engineers have the capabilities and the tools to do a much better job at scenario analysis than some of us did in the, in the past. Um, and it, but but I, would, I would emphasize again that the purpose is not to necessarily generate a set of numbers, a three ring binders full of data, it's to have the discussion, the dialogue, and use that as a communications for uh, leading, leading the company. So that's my background and pitch on uh, strategic planning, all the way down to scenario planning and different from budget forecast and business planning. So that's not something that necessarily is, you know, the, your technical mine engineering um, issues and challenges, but hopefully it talk, gets, gives you a little bit of insight into how a company might make these decisions, how they might move them forward, how do they communicate them within the, the organization. And I'd like to just open it up for any questions that you've got. We'll see if we've got answers. Steve. Can you give us some examples from your career? Of, of 
And some of the scenarios you worked through were some of the planning things. I mean, you and I've been through right. a number of them, but I mean, can you illustrate maybe for the yeah, and I'll and I'll actually I'll go out of just the uh, from from my experience out of the mining time and and some of the companies that were the best at this were not necessarily the mining companies, um, but what we looked at was in a uh, chemical manufacturing company um, looked at changes in a shift of the market away from in this case we had two products going to industrial and how do we have to change the the capital structure the facilities, um, and we actually made some changes that we had, we had run scenarios, and um, what we thought was a product that was a loss leader, actually, we, we, when we took a look at it on post-observation, it was actually our high, most highly profitable, and we redesigned an entire plant and an entire production uh, stream because we took a look at some scenarios and as we started to move, as the market moved away from that, what we thought was a loss leader, when, upon closer observation, we actually had our highest profit margin. So that's the kind of thing that's, that's not a great example. I do think that one of the, um, some of us that have worked for the same company, people, you know, might have seen this in mining and in gold mining, I'll use in particular, but it's also I think, across all the commodities. To me, scenarios are not just a different gold price. It's not what's what, what do we expect the price to be, so we'll put a plan around that. And what are two bounded gold prices? But that's just now. But, but if you actually have a discussion of what's the direction that the industry is moving um, and what are the externalities that are going to come to bear on the companies, I think that can be incorporated in your scenarios as opposed to just saying, well, we're gonna use a $1,200 gold price as a base and we'll do up, upside at 1,800 and downside at 800. To me, that that just that just tells you what the financial result might be, but you're not having much discussion about what does that want to look like. So. So I, I was looking for the word <coughs> diversity in your presentation because I've, I've been in many cases where people are like thinking within an organization and very limited imagination and they don't even want diversity of thought. And if you're really going to be effective, particularly at scenario planning, you have got to reach out beyond beyond the people who are already there. Yeah, so I what's your experience? That's an excellent point. And what I would say is that when I talked about there's a time when you have a debate and you go out back and forth to have discussions. I think that's the place that a company has to have those discussions about diversity of perspective, diversity of opportunity, um, and, and bring in those different uh, roles. In fact, um, there were some companies I've been around that actually identified somebody and said, we want you to come in and be a contrarian as we go through this exercise. She did that naturally, and that always helped. Uh, that always helped us to to come up with better plans. And you have somebody that will take a look at it from a diff different perspective. The the potential for groupthink in a company and in planning, I think, is is very high. And you have to make a concerted effort to bring in that diversity of of perspectives and views and views of the world and where it's going. Um, Not just the contrarian side, but the expanding side, the peripheral vision side. Um, of where the industry is going. And that's going to be a continuous process because otherwise you're going to reevaluate your plan and your progress every year and the world's fine, so fine. Right. And, you know, nothing's changed, we were right, yay us. But you're missing the whole boat. And I would and I would say that that's what I include in the differentiation between a Strategic plan that's done like a three to five year as opposed to just doing annual plans. That annual plans, as you just kind of described it, it's kind of, you know, put the numbers together, we run on this. But if every year you're changing that plan in some direction, you're going to probably take a zigzag path and, and not necessarily have a lot of continuity to your, your goals, objectives, and strategy around how you're running the company, which I think is where the diversity and, uh, of views, perspectives, um, and a, a different view of where the, where's the world going, you know, whether we all see that right now, certainly as we take a look at the, 
uh, minerals were going forward. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, I'll give you a long disappointed question. So when, 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 I, when I think about strategic planning, to be an ISO coach, so when you're a coach, you have players, individual skills, and then the next group is group skills, then you have team skills, and on the top, the last part is the strategy, right? The system, right? So I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking about it just in Minnesota. And his son got promoted a year ago to a position where he's in a more strategic level. Here's the problem: they didn't replace him. So, in the hierarchy of the business, how do you find the time and the people when you're carrying out your day-to-day -day functions? To actually carry out the strategic plan. And I think in our industry, it's becoming more increasingly difficult to build a group that can meet the needs of and carry out that higher level function. So I'd just like to, do, maybe I'm off base, but I see that as a big challenge. I, I would agree with you, and I say the challenges, and that's why. Um, Talking about this in the context of this is not something that everybody does. Well, they may want to, but like, you know, <laughs> like I'm sure my son for the last year would have liked to assume his real job. Just what, but there's nobody out there. Right? And so, if you so take a look at the planning hierarchy, yeah. you know, budgets and forecasts, they always get done. Yeah. Because that's what we're exactly. going to run. That's what we're yeah. going to run this year, right? Yeah. You can always push off strategic planning. That's what and you saying. can either do it from a standpoint of it just not as much serious attention to it or you know or not as many resources to it i would suggest that that's actually not a good idea and it keeps us from actually uh, uh overcoming the issues and challenges <coughs> of a changing world of a changing industry mm -hmm. because you're you, know, you can always put it off but i've seen many companies that that do very, you know, quick uh, amount of time on what I think is the core to the company's competitive advantage of just strategic planning. And they do it as an exercise to get a series of numbers out. Mm -hmm. And they only put in as many resources as it's required to get that done. And then it's not really used to help lead and coordinate and communicate to the organization. So, I mean, I answer that a little bit differently than it's asked. My question was, but I'm just trying to... I am, strategic planning is important, but in these days, I mean, I'm just sitting here with you and you got a text about, hey, I need a <coughs> minimal specialist at any other site. There is just so many agencies out there now. How do you find the time for people to get to that higher level? I know it's important. I'm thinking from a personal experience. With my son, he got promoted, but he's still in the same old job. Which, there was nobody which, out which given the state of the industry, I'm not yeah. sure is an issue just in strategic yeah. planning. And if Priscilla brings up more modern issues, or you know, I guess and there's all these other factors, the strategic planning becomes a life of its own. So it's it's becoming more yeah. important, not less important. Yeah. It requires better skills, not poorer skills. And I think it need, it needs to have people that are embedded in the process, the strategic planning process, very well connected with the senior executives of the company. And I'm going to presume senior executives of the company align with with their direction. What do they see as, as how they're going to have a competitive advantage? Um, but a, a lot of times, and I, those of you in the industry probably have examples where I've seen the strategic planning kind of set aside because I don't have time and effort and or expertise yeah. um, at it. I, that's why I, I would challenge some of our future mining engineers to be thinking about this differently from a, not just the, the technical mine engineering, yeah. but where's the business need to go and how are we going to get there? And we get people who are participating at that level of discussion that might be some of the, you know, they might help be able to help make decisions and guide decisions for the company. 
I certainly think you're going to have to, you will have, although I say it's kind of a process and it's a discussion, there's going to be milestones in that strategy. Right. If you're trying to enter a market and you want to have, you know, market participation at 25% and currently at 20, you're going to, you're going to have some markets that come out of it. Um, sometimes that's a little different for a non-market focused planning like gold. Um, but I think when you talk about other commodities and in the mining industry, um, you have to have <coughs> milestones to identify you know, what markets we're going to be and how large we want to be, because that then drives what you can do from a from a capital standpoint, from a human standpoint. So I think you're you're going to have. I don't want to say that you're not going to have milestones and targets and goals in a strategic plan, um, but you're going to see. The strategic plan hopefully also um, develop those goals and plans on a on an annual basis or, or three to five year basis. How do you measure the success of your strategy? Yeah, I think quite subjectively, whether yeah. you're comfortable that it's it's in just I would say is it anticipating and giving you uh, the opportunity to respond. To issues and challenges before they before they happen, that you're not you're not surprised. You've given some thought to what the world might look like in the future. You have a, a bit of an idea of what your company would look like as a result of those changes. And from a unique perspective, because you work for a major and you work for change, and everything in between, and so. I would say the process that I've been involved with was quite different from a large corporation to small junior. But I, I don't think the importance is any less. And I, I would also suggest that to those shareholders that the company should put together a strategy and they're going to have a goal should align with the shareholders. But if it doesn't, then shareholders might go someplace else. Um, I, I think it becomes somewhat of an individual thing with the staff on the, on the juniors because they don't have the excess excess staff to do that. It's, it's much more challenging. And, and what I discuss here is really kind of an experience on some of the, the larger companies I've been in. In terms of your strategic planning process, is that more part of your executive suite and changes as your CEO or his suite changes, or is it more embedded to a specific company and the CEO just kind of adapts to what is already there? I think it's certainly led by the executive, whether it's CEO and the executive team. Um, 
but they're not going to do the work of that strategic plan. So I think they're going to give direction and guidance to to other planning groups. And, and that group's going to kind of work a process within the organization, come back to the executives, and I think executives can say, you know, is this what I would have expected or just from a standpoint of the process, not necessarily the results. Um, but the role of, I said, the role of managers and the role of executives to make set direction and, and make decisions about the company. Um, they have to direct strategy, but I think they also have to respect the fact that um, if we get answers that are a little bit different than we had expected, we ought to, we ought to consider and, and think about that. And does that change our allocation of, of resources? From the perspective of students and coming out from the industry, how do we become a part of the district planning groups? Yeah, I would I would suggest it's probably not something straight out of yeah. you know, undergrad or graduate work. <clears throat> Typically, the most effective strategic planning groups that I've been around is a group of it is a diverse group, different backgrounds, different perspectives, um, and different experience, and there is a uh, a time component to that ex to that experience. It's not, a, it's not a set time, but I think you're going to want people who are going to have uh, some experience, some time, some understanding, both from a, a company standpoint, also from an industry standpoint. So I would suggest many of your strategic planning people are under senior planning group. But having run some of those, I can also say there's some really good talented people that come out, you know, very soon after they graduate from the university and have great ideas and great tools and great skills. But they probably might not lead the process, but they'd be a, a strong part of the process. I'm sure it's going to be company individual individual things. Yes. When doing scenario planning, um, you say you have the optimistic, pessimistic, realistic uh, viewpoints. Do you often, because there are a lot of ways something could go better for you, there are a lot of ways that things could go worse for you, and you talk about how you want your optimistic to be different enough from your realistic that it's valuable. Is there kind of a limit to where you put, you know, this is something that's very likely to happen that could go very well versus this thing came completely out of the blue because planning for the, especially things that come completely out of the blue like to have enough plans to cover all of that would be very resource intensive it sounds like um and so especially for like smaller companies they might not have the capability to do that level of planning is there like a good i guess almost metric for how you quantify where to put your optimistic mark, where to put your realistic, where to put your pessimistic. I don't know that, I don't know of a, and others here may, but I don't know of a, a very objective way to define that. But I think when you're trying to set those boundaries, you want something that is reasonable enough for us to consider that if the world goes in this direction, and, and, I, and I, I don't, I can't put a number on it, I don't think. Um, I, kinda, I think many of us would know it when we saw it, but it's something that's, I use the word realistic, right? it's, it's possible enough that you say, yeah, the world, if we take a look at these eight parameters of our company and our business, these, if they all wind up in a negative way, that'd be kind of our pessimistic case. And that's something that we should have a bounded plan around. Same thing on, on the positive side. At the same time, what you would what you probably realize in your you put a plan together and then you go execute, there's probably pluses and minuses, and they're kind of offset and you end about you end up about in the middle of where you expect it. But I would suggest that that discussion is important to understand. Even if you had pluses and minuses and they canceled out, you're kind of about where you thought you would be. There are some of those that might have been more critical or more surprising than you thought. And even though it was canceled out by some other positives, um, you, you might want to go back and consider that because it was actually an indication of 
challenges and problems. I haven't run a planning group for quite a few years. But I certainly believe that the world that you are in right now is moving faster and changing. And um, either you can say, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do scenarios around it because it's changing so fast that I can't keep up. I would suggest that you actually put something around it and say, we're gonna do some scenarios so it gives us an idea of what's coming. Uh, we may move quicker one way or you know, pessimistic or optimistic than we thought, but we've at least given it some thought, so it doesn't totally surprise us. Again, you know, the challenges of planning in today's world, I mean, in the last five years, I think, are significant, and I don't expect they're going to get much easier. But I don't know if the objective is to quantify the balance. Yeah. Experience, how serious um, are the needed advance for changes? Are companies are integrating? The potential for carbon pricing into their plans they do, are they saying, okay, we're just going to put enough of a buffer so that we can absorb that price at some point? Or we're going to invest so that we've got lower carbon technology. Do you see a, a trend on that? Well, I only know what I'm kind of, I kind of reading in the journals and the opinions and talks of people that we are, um, that are talking about it right now. But I would, I would think that that's a strategic component of the company's plan. And you are seeing many companies, certainly in the mining industry, that are embedding those in their, in their plans. I don't know whether they're doing that as scenarios or whether they're saying this is our basic plan that we're going to operate around. You certainly are seeing some of the companies are saying that's our, our strategy. <laughs> Take a look at some of the copper companies. I think they're very bullish on the use of copper in uh, you know, a, a, a renewable energy scenario. And so I would suggest some of them are actually leveraging that as a competitive advantage that they have. And so they may have different targets and goals around carbon footprint or something of that sort. So that, those are, I think they're definitely being embedded in, in plants right now. Anything else? Well, you know, we just kind of stimulate some thought about future, not probably something that you're doing today, um, but something I think that you have to think about and question how do you get, if, you're, if it's actually of interest to you, there are career paths I think you can take to move down in that, in that direction. It's probably not, it's probably not a typical profile for every mining engineer coming out of graduate or undergraduate programs to kind of end up in strategic planning, but there are probably steps one can take, you know, post-graduation that would get them into that planning world. It's important to understand. And then, yeah, it's still important to understand. I think one of the, one of the questions that I think often we have is, how do you actually incorporate scenarios and some of these discussions into Pit limit determination. And I'm not convinced you do. Um, I'll leave that to you all as experts. Um, <coughs> that would be the question I would think a lot of my engineering students are saying, well, how do I actually program all this into pit limit design? And uh, that, that's really challenging. So I, I would probably separate, you know. My evaluation, my different determination and design from strategic planning. You know, I don't know where the crossover crossover happens. You know, I'm sure some of you all actually you know, all have, have ideas on how that works. But. Okay, anything else? All right. Thanks, Thanks for your time. Time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you.